My name is Sarah Watson, and I am with Looking for Lincoln and the Abraham Lincoln National Heritage Area. Welcome to tonight's show, Abraham Lincoln and the Transcontinental Railroad. This is part of our series of Looking for Lincoln Conversations. Tonight's show is in partnership with Union Pacific Railroad. We at Looking for Lincoln are grateful for the support we receive from the Union Pacific Foundation and value our partnership. These Looking for Lincoln conversations are a series of live virtual programs featuring a variety of topics surrounding the life and times of Abraham Lincoln. For more information about the conversations, you can go to our website, lookingforlincoln.org. Tonight's program is funded in part by a grant from the Illinois Arts Council. It is now my pleasure to introduce Chris Falillo. Thank you very much, Sarah, and good evening, folks. Abraham Lincoln's life spanned a period of tremendous growth and expansion for our young nation, and Lincoln would play a significant role in that growth. From his earliest days as a traveling lawyer to his time as President of the United States, Lincoln was directly involved with a new growing form of transportation that would come to dominate the nation, the railroads. It would be Lincoln's extensive experience with railroads and railroad law that would give him the insight and the vision to link the East and the West Coasts for the very first time with a transcontinental railroad. Now, though it would not be completed until four years after his death, the impact would be immense. Before the Transcontinental Railroad was built, it cost over $1,000 to travel from the East Coast all the way to the West. Once the line opened up, that charge dropped to $150. Tonight, the education coordinator for the Union Pacific Railroad Museum in Council Bluffs, Iowa, will join us to discuss Abraham Lincoln's connection with the Union Pacific and the Transcontinental Railroad. Please welcome Lindsay Marolt. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Lindsay. I'm the education coordinator at the Union Pacific Railroad Museum in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Um, and I'm excited to be here to talk to you about Abraham Lincoln and the railroads. So I've got my slideshow right here, all ready to go. So like Chris said, Lincoln had uh, long been a supporter of rail development in the United States. And he even represented a number of railroads in his Law, law practice before he was became the president of the United States. Um, and then when he was president, during the Civil War, signed into law the construction of the first continental rail, tran, the first transcontinental railroad. Union Pacific still today treats Lincoln as something of a founding father. So let's uh, start at the beginning then. So Abraham Lincoln was born in 1809. Um, meanwhile, the birth of American railroading is a little bit more difficult to pin down. There's an early survey map from Pennsylvania that shows a commercial tram road for a quarry that's also from 18, 1809. Um, and then the New Jersey Railroad was the first railroad chartered in 1815. However, rail American railroading didn't really get off the ground until 1827 when the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad became the first US railway chartered for commercial transport of passengers and freight. The BNO was then opened in 1830, and thus the railway age in the United States began just as Lincoln was entering adulthood and first moved to Illinois, the state where he would make his name in law and politics. Lincoln served in the Illinois State Legislature from 1834 to 1842. It was during this time that the first railroad came to Illinois. The Northern Cross Railroad was the first to operate in that state, and Lincoln, a Whig at the time for the Republican Party, was not founded until 1854, generally supported internal improvements and investments in things like canals and railroads. He was a major supporter of the 1837 Illinois Internal Improvement Act, which included abundant funding for rail lines. Lincoln also represented a number of railroads as a young lawyer. Notably, he served in, as an attorney for the Illinois Central Railroad, the Chicago and Alton, the Ohio and Mississippi, and the Rock Island. 
One of Lincoln's most notable cases was the Rock Island Bridge case, um, about the very first bridge to be built across the Mississippi River in the 1850s. Very soon after it was built, a steamboat hit the bridge and sank. This set off a court case that very simplistically boiled down to steamboats versus railroads. At this time, bridges as public nuisances generated a fair bit of litigation in the United States. At a time when riverboat travel and shipping was still dominant, steamboat interests were powerful and they didn't like it when bridges impeded their river traffic, even less so when they were causing, when they were the cause of costly crashes. Though railroads were growing rapidly, the paradigm was slow to shift. This Rock Island Bridge uh, connected the Chicago and Rock Island Railroad with the newly chartered Mississippi and Missouri Railroad, which would be the first railroad in the state of Iowa. The Rock Island Bridge was constructed as a joint venture between the Bridge Company, which was related to the Rock Island Company, and the Mississippi and Missouri Railroad Company with its costs being shared. On May 6, 1856, 14 days after the first train had crossed over the Rock Island Bridge, a steamboat, the Effie Alton, built only a few months earlier, struck one of the bridge's piers as it was proceeding upriver from St. Louis. It spun out of control, hit the pier, and quickly burst into flames. The resulting fire destroyed not only the boat, but also a portion of the bridge. The approximately 200 passengers and crew escaped, but the cargo and merchandise, mach machinery, and livestock was almost totally lost. The steamboat interests sued, and Rock Island hired Abraham Lincoln in their defense. Although the case was eventually dropped, this litigation went a long way towards establishing the right of railroads to um, build bridges over rivers. Who would have thought that they needed to, to go through court cases to, to establish the right to build railroad bridges. The Rock Island Bridge litigation was actually a pivotal step in Lincoln's career and solidified his growing reputation as a railroad lawyer. So part owner um, of that Rock Island Bridge was Iowa's Mississippi and Missouri Railroad, which I wanna spend a moment on because it brings us close to one of the key players in Union Pacific's history, the notorious Thomas Durant, a man about whom very few had nice things to say. In short, he was a charlatan. In 1853, Durant got involved in the newly chartered Mississippi and Missouri Railroad, which intended to build Iowa's first railroad from the Mississippi River to the Missouri River. Construction was slow due to a series of financial issues and Durant mostly used his business positions to scam people and run financial schemes. It was his role with the Mississippi and Missouri Railroad that brought him to Union Pacific, and close to Lincoln. Durant would use the Mississippi and Missouri and the power of the presidency to scam investors and speculators just a few years later. Little of the Mississippi and Missouri actually got built in a timely manner. Um, by the time the Transcontinental Railroad was being built, um, it had barely made it halfway across Iowa, but it was enough for Durant's needs. So around this same time, elsewhere in the country, um, in the mid-1850s, um, spurred in part by the discovery of gold in California and its subsequent statehood and the growing sectionalism crisis over the issue of slavery, the United States started to look seriously into the feasibility of constructing a transcontinental railroad. Such a thing was meant to tie California and its gold more concretely to the rest of the Union in the East, as well as to accelerate and secure U.S. conquest of the West. So in 1853, Congress authorized Secretary of War Jefferson Davis to oversee in-depth surveys of five potential railroad routes. The expeditions produced an enormous amount of data on the nature and geography of the West, and the government published many volumes and accompanying illustrations. This image here represents a pass in the Rocky Mountains along the central route. This map produced in 1855 from, that, um, from those surveys shows the five proposed routes that were surveyed. Lincoln would eventually choose a route kind of similar to the central one, although didn't follow it exactly, starting here in, in Iowa and Nebraska. And you can see Council Bluffs on that map here, which is where the museum is today. 
though Congress was unable to get the Transcontinental Railroad project off the ground in the 1850s due to sectionalism and the date debates over ex the extension of slavery, the topic of a Pacific Railroad was very much a live one heading into the 1860s. And so, of course, one that Lincoln would be well aware of. So in the midst of traveling around Iowa giving speeches, Abraham Lincoln visited Council Bluffs, Iowa for a couple of days in August 1859 to visit some friends from Springfield and to investigate a parcel of land. What would have otherwise been a fairly unremarkable visit takes on greater weight because Council Bluffs would just a few years later be fixed by Lincoln as mile zero of the Transcontinental Railroad. Council Bluffs at the time was a small Western town and pretty rough around the edges. Its significance came in its railroad potential. The Mississippi and Missouri Railroad had plans for it. Grenville Dodge, a railroad engineer and future engineer of the Union Pacific lived there and believed very strongly in it as an ideal location for a railroad route. So Lincoln was in town to assess some land that he was buying from his friend, Nathan Judd, Judd, who was the general counsel of the Rock Island Railroad, um, had been had recommended Lincoln for the Rock Island Bridge case and had become financially overextended. And so he asked Lincoln for a $3,000 loan. That's about $100,000 in today's money. Lincoln requested security in exchange for advancing funds and Judge proposed a mortgage on land he had acquired for speculation in Council Bluffs. Railroad speculation in the West was quite rampant. Um, any, almost anybody who was anybody was involved in, in Western speculation. Um, so Lincoln came to Council Bluffs almost um, on a whim uh, to assess the value of this property, as well as to call on the officers and the Pusey's old Springfield acquaintances who were now living in Council Bluffs. While he was there, he also did some light sightseeing, gave a somewhat impromptu speech. He was quite well known by this time as a politician and for the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Um, and he made the acquaintance of a man named Grenville Dodge. Dodge, then an engineer for the Mississippi and Missouri Railroad, who had a great deal of interest and expertise in railroad routes. Um, Lincoln, who had large political ambitions, was eager to hear Dodge's thoughts on the best potential route for a transcontinental railroad. Dodge explained that he thought the road should begin at Council Bluffs and continue west via the Platte River route. Dodge later recorded in his memoir that Lincoln, quote, expressed himself as believing that there was nothing more important before the nation at the time than the building of a railroad to the Pacific coast. He ingeniously extracted a great deal of information from me about the country beyond the river, the climate, the character of the soil, the resources, the rivers, and the route. Dodge came away from this meeting quite impressed with Lincoln, um, and he ended up campaigning for him when he was nominated for president in 1860. When Lincoln was nominated for president um, at the Republican con convention, the Republican National Convention in May 1860, the 16th plank of the party's platform was that, quote, that a railroad to the Pacific Ocean is imperatively demanded by the interests of the whole country, that the federal government ought to render immediate and efficient aid in its construction, and that as preliminary hereto, a daily overland mail route should be promptly established. Mail was always an important part um, of the Transcontinental Railroad. So I think you're probably all pretty familiar with what happened next. Lincoln won the election of 1860, 1860 and the South seceded not long after. While the, middle, while the middle of a bloody civil war might not seem like the most opportune time to embark on a massive infrastructure project, it was partially because the Southerners had left Congress in the first place that they were even able to decide on a route for the railroad at all, the central one that would primarily benefit the Northern states. Furthermore, it was seen as even more necessary to secure California to the Union. Although it would not be finished for years, Congress saw the military utility of such a railroad as well. So in 1862, Congress passed and Lincoln signed the Pacific Railroad Act, which chartered Union Pacific and hired Central Pacific to hire a to build a transcontinental railroad. It authorized bonds to be issued to the railroad companies at the rate of 16,000 
$16,000 per mile of tracked grade completed west of the base of the Sierra Nevadas and east of the base of the Rocky Mountains. Additionally, it authorized a bond of $48,000 per mile of tracked grade completed over and within the two mountain ranges limited to 300 miles total and 32,000 per mile um, of a com completed grade laid between the two mountain ranges. The Pacific Railroad Act in conjunction with the Homestead Act also passed in 1862 were both key legislation in the United States pursuit of manifest destiny, the belief that the United States had the right and responsibility to conquer the entire North American continent. So here's Dodge again, um, but by 1863, he was serving as an intelligence officer in the Civil War. The Pacific Railroad Act had given Lincoln the power to determine the eastern terminus of the railroad, and he, remembering his talk with Dodge in 1859, wished to consult him again on the topic. Dodge wrote in his memoir of the meeting that, quote, several towns on the Missouri River were in competition for the terminus, but Mr. Lincoln practically settled the question in favor of the location I recommended, which was Council Bluffs, Iowa. Soon after, Lincoln issued this presidential order setting the eastern terminus of the railroad at the western boundary of the state of Iowa as lies between the north and south boundaries of the United Township within which the city of Omaha is situated, which is a really complicated way of saying Council Bluffs. Now, this um, order should have been made public, but the order was handed off to Thomas Durant, who you'll remember from before was involved in the Mississippi and Missouri Railroad of Iowa. By 1863, Durant was the vice president of Union Pacific and he kept Lincoln's order in his pocket for a while. Durant had made a fortune smuggling contraband cotton from the Confederate States with the aid of Grenville Dodge. By investing his earnings in an underhanded subscription scheme, Durant had secured control of the Union Pacific. He assumed the vice presidency and named an associate as figurehead. When Abraham Lincoln named Council Bluffs, Iowa as the eastern terminus of the railroad, Durant sent his surveyors across the river to Omaha where he held property, avoiding the costs of a big river bridge and presumably the potential costs of litigation from steamboat interests. Durant announced that Union Pacific would connect his own Mississippi and Missouri line, causing the M&M stock to rise sharply. He then sold his shares discreetly and bought stock in the competition. Then he spread rumors that the connection would be the Cedar Rapids and Missouri line. Investors then flocked to that company and divested themselves of Mississippi and Missouri, which Durant then brought, bought back at a very low cost. This scheme made Durant and his cohort cohort a cool five million dollars in a neat little bit of insider speculation. All these shenanigans meant that Lincoln had to issue a second order in 1864 publicly fixing the eastern terminus of the railroad at Council Bluffs. After much lobbying of Lincoln himself as well as many congressmen, the Pacific Railroad Act was updated and amended in 1864 to allow the railroads to more easily raise funds. The Transcontinental Railroad was not a project that many investors had a ton of faith in, so it was slow to attract funding. It was a huge undertaking and there was no real guarantee that it would pan out, even with the backing of the US government fractured as it was at the time. The 1864 changes to the Pacific Railroad Act significantly sweetened the deal for investors. Now, because of money issues and a labor shortage, um, there's not very many able-bodied men around in the middle of wartime. The Union Pacific Railroad had barely begun construction by the time Lincoln was assassinated in 1865. But that doesn't mean that our story is over quite yet. Between 1863 and 1864, um, a special presidential train car was constructed to transport Lincoln and his cabinet. It was extremely elaborate and lavish and also constructed to be very safe. It was bulletproof. This, um, think of this as a sort of 19th century Air Force One or a Rail Force One. Lincoln never actually used this fancy presidential train car before his assassination, but after his death, the train car would serve as Lincoln's funeral car as his body was transported from Washington, D.C. through Maryland, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Indiana, and, and Illinois to Springfield on a sort of public mourning tour. 
after that, Thomas Durant public purchased the car for Union Pacific for $6,850. And Union Pacific went on to use it to wine and dine and possibly bribe congressmen and potential investors on excursion trips to see the progress of the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. The interior of the car can be seen here in A.J. Russell's stereo card image showing the Union Pacific officers sitting around a table at Echo City, Utah in 1869. And this is just before the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. Um, in May of 1869. And then this car was later passed around a fair bit before it fell into disrepair and it eventually burned to the ground in a grass fire in Minnesota in 1911. Though one last little piece of this car survives, actually not just one little piece, um, but one significant piece of this car survives. A silver set that belonged with this car formed the very basis of the Union Pacific Historical Collection um, that the museum is today built around. Um, the Union Pacific Historical Collection was formed in 1921 when somebody at the railroad rediscovered it in a vault. Um, the set is currently on display at the museum in what we call the Lincoln Room. Um, and looking at these pictures, I think you can probably guess why we call it the Lincoln Room. Um, there's quite a lot of Lincoln imagery in the Union Pacific Historical Collection, lots of statues, lots of busts, lots of, lots of portraits. Um, and that's because Union Pacific still sees Abraham Lincoln as something of a founding father since he was the one who was president when he signed the Pacific Railroad Act and chartered Union Pacific the Union Pacific Railroad. So you can come see this at the museum uh, yourself if you're in Council Bluffs, Iowa anytime soon. Um, as we just reopened to the public at the start of July, we currently require visitors to make reservation online ahead of time so we can maintain safe distances inside of the museum. But we have lots of great information about the Transcontinental Railroad and Abraham Lincoln's involvement in it. So that is the end of my presentation. And I think that we are gonna open up to questions now. Well, wonderful job, Lindsay. I gotta say, I learned a whole lot about the Transcontinental Railroad and Abraham Lincoln's history with the rails that I didn't know. Uh, let me take just a moment to let folks that are listening to our live stream know uh, this is a perfect opportunity. If you have questions or comments, Write them into the chat, and as I speak with Lindsay here for the next 20 or 30 minutes, we'll get your questions in. So, I have to start off with the first question that we were kind of discussing ahead of time. Uh, when we talk about the Transcontinental Railroad, the image that always pops into everybody's mind is the driving of the Golden Spike. Um, I guess I have been wrong all these years. It wasn't really one Golden Spike. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily a golden spike. Could you could you talk about that? Yeah. So um, the the railroads were presented with four, we think, four ceremonial golden spikes. They weren't all gold. Um, one of them was iron, gold plated. Another one was silver and gold. Another one was silver. Although today we only know the locations, I think, of three of them. Um, one, I believe, is at the Stanford Museum in California. One is in New York City, at the Museum of the City of New York, I think. Um, I'm not 100% sure where the other one is. And then another one seems to be lost, or maybe it never existed and those newspaper accounts were wrong and there were only three to begin with. <laughs> well, I always envisioned the, uh, driving a, a solid gold spike into a rail as a, as a child. And of course, that wouldn't work because gold is too soft but that, that sheds a whole lot of light on that. Now, in terms of railroads, uh, this is gonna be the first time we have a train that goes all the way from Council Bluffs to the West Coast. Now, you're crossing a number of different time zones. Did time zones actually exist yet? Uh, was there a standardized time when, when the Transcontinental Railroad was first being put into place? Uh, time zones did not exist yet. Okay. Um, the railroads adopted time zones in the 1880s. Um, if anybody's interested in learning about that transition, check, um, just Google the day of two noons when, when uh, standardized time went into place. Um, but not having standardized time was a real mess for the railroads. I can only um, imagine. Yeah, um, miscalculating your 
your um, arrival times or or leaving times or any any of your times on the railroads could turn out to be quite deadly. Um, American railroads, because sure. they were being built over such long distances, did not, they tended to only build one set of track. So trains would be going both directions on it. Um, sure. And so if you messed up your time schedule, you could easily crash, crash your trains and that could be deadly and extremely costly. Um, so yeah, they didn't have time zones. It was really messy um, and the railroads didn't adopt them until the 1880s and then nationally um, in 19, the 19 teens. I'm blanking on the exact year yeah. right now. But quite a bit afterwards. I'm, I'm surprised at that simply because I did see um, online, and I believe it might be the St. Louis Museum, you can see an actual train schedule. And it's, it's just chaotic, um, you know trying to balance all those things out. And I'm thinking more from the, from the train perspective, exactly from what you're saying with the potential for crashes and such. Mm -hmm. um, that had to be, wow, that had to be mind boggling. Yeah, that's why railroad <laughs> employees were so attached to their, their finely made pocket watches. Yes. Uh, we've had a couple of questions from our audience here. Uh, the first one uh, wants to know, did Lincoln know or find out about the insider trading that went on? And if so, uh, did he do anything about it? Um, I'm not. I'm not totally sure. I wasn't able to find anything that discussed Lincoln's uh, thoughts or feelings on on all that insider trading. Um, on the one hand, he probably was aware that it existed. That was pretty common um, mm -hmm. 19th century business practices. Um, a lot of this stuff. My boss likes to say that um, financial regulations exist because of the railroads. Um, and it's because of all of these financial shenanigans. Like once people mm -hmm. found out about them, they were really mad. Um, but for for the most part, I I couldn't say what his what his feelings were on on all of those financial machinations. He was probably busy with other things, honestly. Well, I suspect, and of course, I don't really have a hard firm answer either. But I suspect that there was so much corruption going on in the war as well that that Lincoln recognized that he had goals to accomplish and simply put up with that to get the things he wanted to get done. I think I probably. Mean, <laughs> if you think about the Transcontinental Railroad and the time that it's put into play with the war beginning, this is a, a tremendous vision that Lincoln has, and it's, it's forethought about how the nation has to continue growing after the war. Um, you know, it's just a, it's a pretty amazing thing to me. Uh, we've got another question from the audience. Uh, and actually, this is, I'm kind of curious about this myself. How fast could trains go, given the steam technology of the time? That is a great question, and one that I would have to Google to find out. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't, I don't know off the top of my head what, um, what the average train speeds were. Mm -hmm. Not as fast as they were today, but... No, no. And I don't know why, but I thought, I want to say I ran across something that might have said in the 60 mile range um, at some point. Yeah, um, that sounds about right. So uh, another audience member wants to know, how did the lack of Southern senators and congressmen affect the passage of the 1862 Railroad Act? Um, it made it possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was a whole lot easier to pass the Railroad Act without the Southerners. Um, that was a huge, the Southern, the sectionalism was a huge um barrier to getting transcontinental railroad legislation passed in the first place because there was so much argument over where the railroad would be placed sure. and who it would benefit. So with the Southerners out of the picture, it was a lot easier for the Northerners to choose a route that would benefit them. Yeah. Now, would the, the, the economic impact of that, would that have been uh, something that the Southerners were trying to get for the South and uh, in support of their cause in politics? Yes, in in part. Um, although I have read one historian suggested that Southerners, um, that the Southern Democrats were resistant to Western railroad building at all because they were afraid that it would impede the expansion of slavery. Um, mm -hmm. So they were they were less enthusiastic about Western railroads to begin with. But certainly a railroad in the South would make it a lot easier to ship things like 
cotton and tobacco, um, sure. while Northern railroads would, would benefit Northern industry a lot more. Sure. Now, I know one of the things that, that I thought was so fascinating about the story of the Transcontinental Railroad is the, the compensation that the railroads would get. Um, uh, so many thousands of, of dollars per mile uh, and different rates, I believe, for prairies, um, but also big chunks of land. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how that might have impacted the process? Yeah, so part of uh, the deal to help fund the railroads was that they received a checkerboard pattern of land grants. Um, so like alternating squares, I can't remember exactly what the square footage was, but the, the second railroad act doubled the, the amount of land that the railroads mm -hmm. received. Um, so in alternating, alternating squares would be railroad land um, right off the right of way, right, af right mm -hmm. off of where the railroad was being built and then half would be public public land. Um, and then the railroads were free to sell this land um, yeah. to, to help finance the railroad. Um, and so that's why when you look at a lot of the advertising from this time period from the railroads, you see a lot of things that are like Union Pacific has cheap land out west in the garden of the garden of the world in Utah. Um, so they were very free with their um, descriptions of how great, how good this <laughs> yes. land was out west. Yeah. Utah is beautiful land, but I don't really think of it as the garden of the West. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hard to farm in. Yes. Uh, another audience question here. Uh, did Lincoln know Jack Casement? Casement lived in Painesville, Ohio, in Lake County, Ohio. He had a significant role in the Transcontinental Railroad. Do yeah, you know so anything about that? Casement was, um, he like directed the workers on the Union Pacific. I don't know if they knew each other, though. Um, it's possible, but I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm fascinated by uh, the character of uh, General Grenville Dodge, uh, who seems to be a, a straight shooter in this entire process, as opposed to a lot of the businessmen who are, you know, focusing on making a profit for themselves. Um, now, I understand he was a former Union general. Is that correct? Mm hmm. And then that, was he responsible for, for literally uh, all of the engineering on the Union Pacific part of the track? He, this is the part where my knowledge breaks down a bit because mm -hmm. we get a lot more technical. Um, so I don't know, I can't really speak to like how all was being responsible for all of the engineering, but he was the head engineer of the Union Pacific Road. I would guess that he he delegated a fair amount. Probably. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, I, maybe he just oversaw that. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. we, we have a, a, another audience question here. Um, wh who actually did the labor to build the Transcontinental Railroad? That's um, a great question. I could talk for a long time about the laborers on the railroad. Um, so there's a lot that we don't know about the, the laborers on the railroad, um, but I'll, I'll let you know what we do know. So Union Pacific hired um, a lot of Irish immigrant labor. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know exactly how they, how they got here or where they came from, but we know that they, they referred to a lot of Irishmen. They complained a lot about Irishmen who didn't want to work because they weren't being paid. Um, on the Union Pacific, and then there were likely a, a fair amount of other other European immigrants working for Union Pacific, as well as various um, Civil War veterans. And there's probably a yeah. fair amount of overlap in those groups. Um, and then there's one source that, like, pretty unsubstantiated. I haven't been able to find um, a lot of evidence to back this up, but suggests that there were some formerly enslaved men um, who worked for the railroad, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. And then Central Pacific in over in California, they employed almost entirely Chinese immigrant labor. Um, when they started building the railroad, they tried hiring the local white labor population, but they would often leave to go take better jobs. Um, mining or doing other things, sure. mining or farming. Um, and mm -hmm. so they started hiring Chinese workers. Even though Leland Stanford, who was um, the president of Central Pacific and the governor of California, had run for governor on the anti-Chinese platform, he was pretty uh, noxiously 
anti-Chinese. Mm-hmm. Um, but they ha- they ended up hiring hiring. Um, I think their labor force was over ninety percent Chinese workers, um, and they found that they could exploit them more than they could white workers. Sure. So they paid them less and worked them worked them quite a bit harder. So that's that's generally who made up the workforce of, yeah. of the transcontinental railroad. I would have to imagine that a lot of the Irish workers might have actually come from some of the canal building that had gone on. Because I know, for instance, in Illinois, the I&M canal was largely built with Irish labor. Um, yeah, that's pretty so. likely. And there's all like Irish, um, Irish laborers were quite common building railroads at East as well. So probably, probably sure. some veteran railroad builders. Yeah. Among them. Um, one of our audience members wants to know, did Lincoln stipulate the gauge width for the transcontinental railroad? Yes, I believe that is stipulated in the Pacific uh, Railroad Act. I could not quote to you the exact number, but I remember reading um, that they that they did, and that helped helped. Um, I believe I read that it helped standardize the gauge width yeah. in the United States. I, I seem to remember that uh, the early rails on the East Coast had a, just a range of different gauges, and so it was not possible to go from one to the other. Uh, you were a lot of times simply restricted to your own area. Uh, now, somebody uh, somebody asked about uh, a question here. Without time zones, what would the chaotic schedule look like, for example, between New York City to Chicago? Um, uh, it's hard for me to describe. I could show you. You can actually, you guys can probably just Google. Um, mm-hmm. Google 19th century uh, timetables, railroad timetables. Mm-hmm. I have difficulty reading them, um, although they appear to be pretty orderly. It was generally in in practice that things got got really messy. The one I saw earlier today online, which was for the Union Pacific, had uh, five or six different columns across the top, and then probably thirty or forty columns down, each one with a separate time uh, reference to when it would hit that place on that line in that day, and. Uh, it, it made my head spin just looking at it. Mm-hmm. Very <laughs> I feel complicated. sorry for the guys that had, had to make that actually work. Yeah. Uh, um, is it uh, another audience question here? Is it possible to gain access to the original survey drawings for the Transcontinental Railroad? Um, that I'm not 100% sure. I. So there's a couple of things is mm-hmm. one, do they still exist? Sure. <laughs> Which yeah. is an open question. They may, they may or they may not. Um, or they're, they're, they might, some of them might exist in copies. Um, and I'm not actually 100% sure if we have them in our collection or if they are somewhere else or if they are not existent anymore. Yeah. There's a lot of a lot of early records from the railroads that just don't exist anymore. They they were not operating on the the idea that people were going to be saving a lot of stuff for posterity, and so the yeah. railroad just like got rid of a lot of records. So I'm not I'm really not sure. I couldn't tell you. I, I again I think I saw some uh, information about that, um, and I think it was the St. Louis Museum speaking about the Transcontinental Railroad. But there were a number of the actual reports that were created for. Uh, the president and Congress that they have copies of. So perhaps some of the sketches and such mm-hmm. um, and still those, exist. Like the things that they published, those mm-hmm. surveys that they published. Yes, those those are available in various places. Yeah. yeah. Other than that, I would I would have to imagine Library of Congress or somewhere in the National Archives would be the only possible place to find the originals. Yeah, um, probably. So. Uh, Okay, we have a question here, and I think you addressed it a little bit, but maybe you can expand on it. Did they work on the railway during the Civil War? Yes, kind of. Um, So in California, certainly, um, they were able to start construction earlier than Union Pacific was. Um, I can't Mm -hmm. remember the exact date, but they were able to start during, during the war. Um, Union Pacific officially broke ground in 1863, but they did not have the money or the manpower to actually make very much progress um, until 1865. So they really, the Union Pacific side didn't do a lot of building during the the war, during wartime proper. Yeah, I I imagine it had as much to do with anything as the fact that there were just, uh, the labor force was being sucked up by by the cause of the war. (laughs) 
yeah, they had a lot of labor issues. Yeah. Now, you, you said something uh, early on when you were talking about Lincoln's early railroad career, um, which I, I'm always fascinated with, um, the uh, Rock Island Bridge case and, uh, and the boat, the Effie Afton, that, that crashes into it. Um, I'm wondering if those experiences with Lincoln played some role in his understanding of how railroads worked and eventually uh, meeting uh, with, uh, with Dodge and, and Durant and moving that project forward. What are your thoughts on that? I think almost certainly. Um, based on a couple other things, Lincoln seems like he was a very thorough investigator of the cases that he was representing. Yeah. Um, in that um, Rock Island Bridge case, he actually studied the river currents so thoroughly mm -hmm. that he was able to submit a patent um, for some, I can't even remember what it is now, but some some sort of something related to river currents. Yeah. Um, and so I would imagine that his his avail ability to research and understand his topic would extend as well to to the railroads that he represented. Um, and he was like that that case sort of helped establish him as a a railroad lawyer, and he had a, mm -hmm. has a long history with the Illinois Central Railroad as well. Um, so yes, I think that his experience as a lawyer certainly helped him, helped him make those connections and, and just like understand these yeah. projects in the United States. I, I have heard a story that when he was trying that case and went out to study the river currents, exactly as you're describing, there was a boy on the bridge and he starts to talk with the boy and they figure out a way to measure the current by throwing a stick in and watching it, timing it travel a certain distance. And then Lincoln asks the boy if he knows anybody who worked on the bridge. And the boy's father was the engineer that built the bridge. And then Lincoln got him to actually testify in the case on his, on his behalf. But I, I have to assume that it's these early uh, interactions with the rails that gives him the understanding and the vision to see the potential for what uh, a transcontinental railroad can do to the nation in terms of, of settlement and, and development. Um, what are your thoughts on, on the impact that the, the rail would have ultimately once, it's, uh, once it was completed? The impact was great and extremely complicated. Um, so the railroad was a huge benefit to the United States, to business people, um, and to the United States' um, ambitions to cover the entire continent. Um, but, and something that I didn't mention much at all in the presentation is the people who were already living on that land. Um, so the railroad was devastating to the native peoples whose land yeah. the railroad went through. Um, much of the land allocated to the railroad in, in the Pacific Railroad Acts, um, the United States only had dubious claim to, um, to begin with. <laughs> And, and during construction of the railroad, tribes like the um, Shoshone and the Cheyenne um, were, were waging active war against, against um, the railroads and the United States through the railroads. Um, so much so that the, the railroads like called in the army to be like, you need to send people to to like help protect us. But like that was a huge part of it is that in addition to being a construction site, the Transcontinental Railroad was also kind of a war zone. I could see that. Now, I, I think I did read a comment too that, that um, the life of these very transient towns that were being springing up as the, as the rails went through was pretty wild and woolly. And um, supposedly that has a lot to do with the legend of the wild, wild west. I don't know if there's any truth to that or not, but it, it certainly does make sense. Yes, I think you were thinking of the Hell on Wheels towns. I am exactly thinking of that. I was trying not to say that. <laughs> but you can. You run the museum. Um, I had an audience question here. Um, when did they stop using the Transcontinental Railroad? And I guess I'd amend that to say, have they stopped using it? Not really like kind of in some ways um a lot of like certainly all of the rail that was laid in the 1860s yeah. is no longer the rail that any railroads are using um but a lot of the the grades 
that those laborers built, that they dug um, through the land are still in use um, by the modern railroad. A lot of the, a lot of the route has been adjusted and shifted over yeah. time, um, but there are still pretty significant portions of the railroad that are, that do, that do, do still follow the original transcontinental route. I thought I had heard that, that uh, the empire builder that goes from Chicago out to the East coast may still go along some sections. I, I don't know if there's truth to that or not. Probably. Yeah. Um, so uh, another question here, going back to uh, financial issues. Can you address more specifically how Lincoln may have benefited personally and or financially from the railroads? Um, how was he compensated for, for his work? And how did he have money enough to fund Dodge? That's a lot of questions. Well, let's so, break it down. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Lincoln wasn't personally financing like Dodge. Yeah. That was all, that was all the United States. Um, how he was benefiting personally, I'm not 100% sure. I would need to do a lot more research into like what Lincoln's investments were. But as, as I mentioned, that land that he purchased from, from Judd in, in 1859, um, like that was speculation land sure. that was purchased because, um, because they anticipated railroads would go through those towns. Now, I'm not 100% sure if Lincoln still owned that land when he was president, um, but if he did, then like, it looks a little suspicious that the president like owns land in Council Bluffs and is also like, hey, this is where mile zero of the Transcontinental Railroad should be. That was also pretty par for the course like yeah. 19th century business practices. Yeah. Um, anybody who is anybody, like every politician was speculating in land um, and other businesses. Sure. Yeah, that was common to the point where um, even even settlers themselves uh, would be speculating in land as a way to, to build up a fortune. Um, I assume uh, when he was working as a lawyer, of course, he would have been compensated uh, for his work. Um, I believe in an earlier program, uh, when he did the big uh, Illinois Central case, he, he was paid $5,000, uh, ultimately, although he had to sue to get it. Um, but, uh, and then again, when, you were, when we were talking about Dodge, that would have not been Lincoln funding him personally. That would have been Lincoln making connections uh, as a politician and then eventually, you know, uh, uh, approaching uh, Dodge to do the work on behalf of the, of the nation. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, here's another question from an audience. Is it true that the Transcontinental Railroad was not truly transcontinental for many years after the spike was driven? I heard the bridge across the river between Council Bluffs and Omaha was not built until later. That is true. Ah. Um, <laughs> so remember how I said when, when uh, Durant had had that presidential order placing mile zero at council yeah. bluffs and he was like well we're just going to start building in omaha yeah. on the other side of the river um yeah i don't think that that bridge was built until the 1870s so until then if you wanted to take the train across the united states you would take your train all the way to council bluffs and then you would have to hop on a ferry to get from council bluffs to omaha and then you could get back on the train um, to go from uh, Omaha to Sacramento, California. So yes, that is true. Yeah, that's a, that's pretty fascinating. Um, let's see. Um, so this was literally a game changer when this this new railroad, even if it wasn't absolutely completed, you know, with a few bridges here and there. I mean, it literally changed everything from the manufacturer's point of view, opening up new uh, transportation routes, opening up massive land for settlement and such. Um, you know, Lincoln wouldn't live to see a lot of these changes, but they would definitely affect the future. Do you imagine that this was Lincoln's goal all along? Yeah, I think so. Um... And this was this was the kind of thing that that people in the United States had been talking about for decades um, yeah. about how to, especially once California joined the Union, but also Texas is is 
Um, there is a lot of a lot of desire among some Americans. It certainly wasn't a universal feeling. Mm -hmm. um, there were plenty of people who were like, "No, we're fine. The size that we are, we can stay." Yeah. Um, but yeah, there were a lot of people who who like their end goal was for the United States to cover the entire the entire continent. Yeah, and so, name. Yep, and and um, given the the provisions in the Pacific Railroad Act and the accompanying Homestead Act, which was mm -hmm. the like free land if you improve it for so many years sure. and and stay on it, was meant to attract settlers out west who would use the railroad and and um, fill out the the growing yeah. country. So yeah, this is, that was definitely his his vision for it. Yeah. And I, and I could really see how the, that would create such a, a, a massive rush towards Western expansion that the, the, the Native American peoples that were populating that land at the time uh, would, uh, well, immediately there would be conflicts associated with that, but they would clearly see it as a direct and, and uh, serious threat to their life and life ways. Okay, we've got a, a, a question here uh, from an audience, and then I think I'll wind up with one more after that. So... Um, an audience member would like to know, what did they use for restrooms on the trains? On the trains or, or like building, on the trains. building the transcontinental railroad? Um, well, at the beginning, they used chamber pots or okay. like people would use whatever facilities were available when they got off the trains. Um, mm -hmm. The trains would stop <clears throat> relatively regularly early on because... Um, they didn't have dining cars until like the 1880s, 1890s. So oh. trains would stop at regular enough intervals. So people would like get off for 10 minutes and, and buy food from the, the quick restaurant. And then they would hop back on the train. And so I imagine they would use, uh, they would relieve themselves during those breaks. Um, sure. Otherwise, they would use chamber pots or um, they had toilets on the trains that just like opened out into onto the rails. And yeah. so there was like human waste all along the rails, which is not sanitary. <laughs> I remember being on trains as a child that still used that method. Really? Yeah, you'd open up the, the lever and you'd see the track going by underneath you. It was fascinating to a 10 year old. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine that would be fascinating to anybody, but yeah, yeah, I thought I thought that they um, really made an effort to change that in like the 19 teens and 1920s. They were very concerned with with um, well, sure spread of disease and sanitary such. stuff then. But you know, it takes a long time for the railroads to change stuff. Oh yeah. Now um, th these uh, you mentioned there would be like uh, places to eat and such. Is this the era, or would this have been a little later that they begin to develop the Harvey Girls? And that, that series of restaurants specifically on train routes. Um, yeah, the Harvey Girls is about the same time period, maybe a little bit later. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not 100% sure on the exact dates on that, on that. But yes, this is, that's around this time. Yeah, because I would imagine that this is one of those things that's going to spur rail travel exponentially across the nation. And then that just creates the need for services to, to take care of those as well. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. I've really enjoyed this. Let me give you one last question here to, to kind of uh, roll up our, our, our talk with here. This, the Transcontinental Railroad is, is this staggering feat of engineering and imagination, just the idea that we could create this unified whole, and this would be one of the ways to do it, that brought people literally from walking next to their wagon trains to riding on a train itself. I'm wondering what lessons can we draw from that entire experience regarding Lincoln and the Transcontinental Railroad as we look at the at the issues that we face here today? Oh man, so many lessons. <laughs> well, you know, that's what I figured. Um, I think probably one of the most important lessons is how important it is that we hear many voices when we make um, these sort of of nation changing decisions. Um, the Transcontinental Railroad, while it was a, a topic of public conversation, um, most of the big most of the big decisions were made by like a couple of people, not a terribly, sure. terribly uh, democratic 
process. Um, and a lot of people who were deeply affected by it did not have a, a say in, mm -hmm. in how it went. So I would, I think that one of the most important lessons is how, how important it is that we, that we listen to all voices and hear all voices and consider, consider wide ranging effects of, of the big choices that we make. Yeah, I think that's a, an excellent conclusion to, to wrap up our conversation with. Well, uh, I want to thank uh, Lindsay Merolt from the uh, Union Pacific Railroad Museum in Council Bluffs, Iowa, for sharing her stories and time with us tonight. Uh, a special thanks to the Abraham Lincoln National Heritage Area and Looking for Lincoln for producing this series. Uh, Looking for Lincoln Conversations is supported in part by a grant from the Illinois Arts Council Agency and the National Endowment for the Arts. Thanks so much for being with us, folks. We'll see you next time around. Bye-bye.